So he is going to pitch this talk at another level. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good evening to everybody. Uh, and at the outset, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Tanmay Chakravarti. Uh, who has uh, come all the way to IIT Tirupati to invite me to here to see his institute. And uh, I'm so happy and I'm glad to be here. And also I'm glad that uh, on a Friday evening at 5.30, I could see some students who would like to attend my talk. And uh, uh, today I'm going to talk about crystal structure and the uh, space group. See, basically I am a materials person. My lab we are interested in growing single crystals of intermetallic compounds. I will explain to you what a single crystal is and what is the advantage that you get when you have a single crystal in hand. And uh, all the material properties, uh, it depends on the crystal structure. For example, um, you might have heard of something called superconductors. There are high TC superconductors which was discovered in 1987. Uh, two different materials, yttrium barium copper oxide and bismuth strontium calcium copper oxide. These are high temperature superconductors because their superconducting transient temperature is in the liquid nitrogen temperature. So, <clears throat> in the case of uh, bismuth strontium calcium copper oxide, there are two, three phases, uh, 2201, 2212, 2223, that depending on the number of copper oxide layers, the transition temperature increases. So, the crystal structure is important. So one should know uh, about the crystal structure before you study any of this material property. So I thought that let me give you some examples about crystal structure, how these crystal structure can be developed from the crystallographic information that is available in the database. Uh, so uh, the plan of my talk is uh, I'll start with a very basic question. How many atoms are there in a unit cell, which is a 11th standard uh, physics problem. And uh, I will uh, discuss something about a Wyckoff position. I will explain to you what a Wyckoff position is and uh, discuss about phase group and X-ray diffraction. <coughs> so to start with, if I ask you to count how many atoms are there in the unit cell, of course, any, every one of you can do this. It's a very trivial thing. Uh, but uh, you may be wondering, what business do I have to know how many atoms are there in the unit cell? How does it uh, affect me or something like that? So the material properties, as I told you, depends on how the atoms are arranged inside the unit cell. Uh, so um, supposing if the number of atoms are large in a unit cell, these are good for some thermoelectric materials. So and uh, as I told you, in the case of superconductors, number of copper oxide layer if you increase then the transient temperature increases so the study of crystal structure is important and you need to know how many atoms are there in the unit cell in most cases so this is a typical nacl structure which is there in 11th standard called standard textbook and uh, you can very easily count how many atoms are there in the unit cell now if i show you a unit cell which is again a cubic and if i ask you to count how many atoms are in the unit cell you may count it <coughs> 
but it it may take some little extra effort that you should rotate the sample i mean rotate the unit cell a little bit to see whether the unit cell is lying at the corner or inside or something like that but uh, at the end of my few slides you will you will know that how easy it is to determine how many atoms are there in the unit cell it doesn't take much time to find out figure out how many atoms are there in the unit cell and if you have this kind this is a superconductor uh, which superconducts at around 5 kelvin and if you have that kind of large number of atoms in the unit cell as i told you these are good for thermoelectric material thermoelectric properties so <coughs> let us uh, proceed further and uh, as i told you i am um, working on growing single crystals in the laboratory so to start with uh, let me start with the basic definition of a single crystal what is a single crystal <coughs> If you take any solid state physics textbook, you will see this definition. A homogeneous body consisting of a three dimensional periodic arrangement of atoms, ions or molecules is a single crystal. Very, very straightforward definition. But there is an alternate definition. Materials which produce diffraction spots mm -hmm. are single crystals. That means you take a material and do a, a X-ray diffraction or an electron diffraction using a transmission electron microscopy. And if you see spots in the diffraction pattern, then it is said to be a single crystal. Then now the question comes in your mind, what is the other thing? What is a polycrystal? This is a single crystal. Then what is a polycrystal? Polycrystal is nothing but large number of tiny crystallites. Each crystallite is a single crystal. And polycrystal consists of large number of grain boundaries. Uh, if you have anything, uh, you stop me and ask me the questions if you have. Uh, so, polycrystals are nothing but large number of tiny crystallites. Now, having said that, um, the single crystals produce diffraction spots. What will happen to polycrystalline samples if you take a diffraction, electron diffraction or X-ray diffraction? So, this is the case with a single crystal. This is a single domain. There are no domain, there are no grain boundaries. This is a single unique entity. And if you take a diffraction pattern, it looks like this, symmetric diffraction pattern. It's very, very beautiful to look. And uh, the same thing, if I do a polycrystalline sample, <coughs> there are a large number of grains. Each grain is oriented in a different direction. And these are the grain boundaries. These are the grain boundaries. And because each grain can produce a similar kind of diffraction pattern, and these grains are slightly oriented, misoriented from each other, and these grains, uh, these patterns are slightly, will be tilted. And if you connect it, you can see that the center, you can see that it forms a concentric rings. So, since there are large number of grains which are oriented in different directions, your polycrystalline sample will look like this. If you take a diffraction pattern, it will look like this. So, that's the main difference. So, typically, if you go to an interview and if somebody asks you a question, define a single crystal, most of the students will define this one. A homogeneous material body consists of three-dimensional periodic arrangement of ions or atoms or molecules. On the other hand, if you give this explanation, materials which produce diffraction spots, they are single crystal, then the interviewer will come to know that you know something about single crystal. So, just keep this. So, am I to conclude that these two are not equivalent? Which one? I mean, there are exceptions. Which one? Periodic arrangement of atoms, it need not produce diffraction spots. No, the, the single crystals are periodic arrangement of atoms without any grain boundaries. Oh, so the grain boundary grain is the So the polycrystals are nothing but large number of tiny crystallites. Like each crystallite is a single crystal. So, but it has grain boundaries. <coughs> okay, so then there is something called uh, in between these uh, single crystal and polycrystal, quasi crystals. Quasi crystal has attracted lots of interest. In 2011, it was awarded Nobel Prize for the discovery of quasi crystalline samples mm -hmm. way back in 1986 or 87. Uh, so. This is nothing but any crystal in the three dimensional lattice periodicity is absent. So it's totally a different concept. It also produces diffraction spots, but in the long range, the periodicity is there. In short range, the periodicity is absent. So that's the difference. <clears throat> so, okay, let me, having said, talked about the single crystal so much. So let me explain to you what is the advantage of having a single crystal in hand. So this is an electrical resistivity of an alloy, cerium to nickel 3 germanium pi. I work on magnetic materials and this is a, one of the magnetic systems. And this is the electrical resistivity of a polycrystalline data. It is measured from 300 Kelvin down to 2 Kelvin, very low temperature, liquid helium temperature. <clears throat> 
So uh, this is this compound crystallizes in an orthorhombic crystal structure. When I say orthorhombic crystal structure, the lattice constants A, B, C are not equal and alpha, beta, gamma, the angle between these axes are 90 degrees. So uh, this, uh, poly, this is a polycrystalline electrical resistivity data. On the, if I grow a single crystal and study the same transport property, electrical transport property, by aligning the crystal along the A axis and passing the current along the A axis, the electrical resistivity value is something like this. So here at room temperature, the electrical resistivity value is about 200 micro ohm centimeter. Whereas if I pass the current along A direction, the, the electrical resistivity is about 325 micro ohm centimeter. The same crystal, I remove the electrical contacts along the A direction. I just pass the current along the B direction on the same sample. Then the electrical resistivity comes down to 100 micro ohm centimeter. And then if I pass the, remove the electrical contact and I put the electrical contact along the C direction, that means I pass the current along the C axis and measure the potential difference. Then I have this electrical resistivity, which is about uh, 125 micro ohm centimeter. So if you, if you can do, a, if you have a single crystal, you can do the anisotropic studies. That means you can do this directional dependent property and along each direction, how the electrical resistivity is varying, one can get to know this information. So this is the advantage of having a single crystal in hand. You can do the directional dependent properties. So whereas in the polycrystalline sample, you get an average of this one. So that is the importance of having a single crystal in hand. So <clears throat> since I do lots of uh, magnetic studies, magnetic measurements, I work on magnetic materials. In the, in the case of magnetic materials, there is something called easy axis direction and hard axis direction. That means if you apply a magnetic field along a particular crystallographic direction, the sample gets magnetized more easily than that along the other direction. So this is the magnetic susceptibility of an antiferromagnet material. Antiferromagnet means one spin up and the other spin will be down. That's the, the spins of the electrons will be aligned opposite to each other. So if, you, if, the, if the sample is uh, antiferromagnetically ordering, because the moments are in opposite direction, your susceptibility will go down to zero if you are applying the magnetic field along the moment direction, along this direction. On the other hand, if you apply the magnetic field perpendicular to this one, you will have the susceptibility which will be flat like this. If you have a polycrystalline sample, you don't have this directional dependent property, it will give you the average of this one. Similarly, this is versus temperature. If you go, if you, if you are, if you are going to this temperature, which is in the magnetically ordered state and you increase the magnetic field, you will see that the magnetization increases and at a particular critical field, the spins of this one will align towards the other, other uh, towards the field direction. That means if it is an antiferromagnet, this moment will align towards the field direction. So this happens at a critical field like this and at a very high magnetic field, all the moments will be aligned in the same direction. So this is called a field induced ferromagnetic state. When the spins are aligned in the same direction, then it's a ferromagnetic. And this happens because of high magnetic field, this is a field induced ferromagnetic state. This happens along the easy axis direction. Whereas along the hard axis direction, the magnetization just keeps on increasing. So this is one, one of the cases. In other cases, sometimes the spins does not flip like this. They just reorient as you increase the magnetic field. So this is happening at some particular critical field. Some of the moments turn to a particular angle and that you need to higher, higher, you need to apply higher magnetic fields so that the spins align towards the field direction. So eventually, it leads, to, it leads to the field-induced ferromagnetic state. <coughs> so let's come back to our original story about the crystal structure. So you have studied about uh, the basic definition of lattice in your uh, physics textbook. This is the first chapter in any solid-state physics textbook. Uh, what is a lattice? Yeah, lattice is nothing but an infinite array of points in space. That means they are not atoms. They are just placeholders of for atoms or you can put two or three group of atoms in these lattice places, in these lattice points. Uh, each point has an identical surrounding. And this is a two-dimensional lattice, this is a three-dimensional lattice. The point which I want to emphasize here is that the lattice points are not atoms. They are just placeholders for atom, atoms. So this is a simple example. This is an FCC lattice. This is a face-centered cubic lattice. So as I told you, these are not atoms. So these are placeholders for atoms. So this, sorry, I, for an NaCl, I have this NaCl group of atom, sodium and chlorine. 
If I put this sodium and chlorine in all these lattice points, I get the NaCl crystal structure. Let me show it to you. So I'm just keeping this NaCl group of atom in one of the lattice points. And I just keep adding all this NaCl. Eventually, I get this crystal structure. So, as I told you, this is an FCC lattice. And in this lattice, you can place a group of atoms in that and you can get that to the crystal structure. So, this is this is how the crystal structure is developed. And you may ask the question, how, why this NaCl is in this way? So, that is what the crystallographers have solved the crystal structure and they have given the position for this sodium and chlorine atom should be like this. I will get back to this in a few slides, few slides later. But this is how the crystal, uh, the, the lattice plus the basis gives the crystal structure. If you take any solid state physics textbook, they might have given you lattice plus basis gives the crystal structure. But the physical meaning is this one. The group of atoms, we can put it at those lattice points, then you get the crystal structure. Okay, so then the definition of a unit cell. The smallest component of a crystal which reproduces the crystal by pure translation operation. You just translate it by the lattice constant distance, then you get the same kind of arrangement. That is a simple unit cell. And these days, everywhere they talk about graphene. Graphene is just thing but a yeah, monolayer of uh, carbon atom which is arranged in the honeycomb lattice. And in, in the graphene, you have two atoms in the unit cell. <coughs> and uh, okay, this is just an example of a graphene monolayer. And let's count the number of atoms in the unit cell. This is what we started with, how many atoms are there in the unit cell. And you might have been taught about these things in 11th standard itself, where uh, there are eight sodium atoms at the corner. The big uh, yellow, yellow circles are the sodium atoms. Eight into one by eight will give you one sodium atom. And there are six sodium atoms at all the faces. Six into half is three. And in total, there are four sodium atoms. And then there are 12 chlorine atoms at the edges, 12 into 1 by 4 equal to 3. And then the one chlorine atom at the center of the unit cell, you have one full chlorine. So 3 plus 1 is 4. That means there are 4 sodium atoms in this unit cell and 4 chlorine atoms in the unit cell. So this is very trivial. One can easily find it out. As I told you, if I show this one, it may be a little bit difficult to count how many atoms are at the corners, how many of their surface and all these things. Is there a way out? <clears throat> so this is the information that we have already just talked about. If I see the crystal structure, crystallographic database of sodium chloride, I will get this information. That means the space group is Fm minus 3m and the Wyckoff position. These are special positions in the unit cell and uh, it is given as 4a and 4b. <coughs> the 4a atom is sitting at the XYZ position, 0, 0, 0, and 4B, at, uh, the chlorine is occupying the 4B position, which is sitting at 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. So the number here, 4, tells me that that many number of atoms of sodium is there in the unit cell. And this 4 tells me that many atoms are there in the chlorine. So this is very, very simple. So just by looking at these Wyckoff position, the multiplicity factor, you can tell that there are as many atoms in the unit cell. There are 4 plus 4, there are 8 atoms in total in the unit cell of sodium chloride. Out of that 8, 4 is sodium and 4 is chlorine. So then, so where do we find all this information about the, uh, the space group? So these are special positions for this space group, Fm minus 3m. So you can find the information about the various space group in this Bilbao crystallographic server. This is an open database. You can get to know about the various uh, space group positions and Wyckoff position details in this one. Uh, if I look into this uh, database, uh, this Fm minus 3m space group, the first at, uh, the first position is 4a, where the atoms are occupying 0, 0, 0. The second is 4b, where the atoms are occupying at 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. So this is where the sodium and chlorine atoms are sitting in this uh, uh, sodium chloride unit cell. So now the question comes about this one. Uh, of this, uh, this is a crystal structure of rhodium-17, sulfur-15 which is a superconductor, which superconducts at around the 6 Kelvin. Uh, and if I see this one, the road, there is one rhodium atom occupying the Wyckoff position 24M. And there is a second rhodium atom occupying at 6E, third one at 3D, and fourth one at 1B. If I count 24 plus 6, 30, 33, 
34. So there are 34 rhodium atoms and there are 30 sulfur atoms. It's as simple as that. All that you need to know is that the crystallographic information, which is available in the various databases, crystallographic database. And uh, from this, you can count how many atoms are there in the unit cell. So there are a total number of 64 atoms. And actually, if you see that, the actual formula of this compound should be rhodium-34 and sulfur-30. That should be the actual formula. That means there are two formula units per unit cell. You just divide it by a normal, now to normalize it, and then you give you say that the actual chemical composition is rhodium 17 sulfur 15 but in principle it should be rhodium 34 and sulfur 30 that is the actual formula even sodium chloride na4 cl4 that's the, there are four formula units in sodium chloride but here it is there are two formula units per unit cell so this second letter the mjh that is for the symmetry operations yeah no no that is not the symmetry operation they, those are identifiers so I will, I, will, I will tell you, I will tell you here. See, for example, <coughs> so in the case of sodium, there are 4A, it started with 4A, but you see here, there are 1A. There is only one possible position of this one. So in the case of sodium chloride, for that particular space group, there are four possible, uh, four atoms or can be possible in the unit cell. But here, for this 1A position, there can be only one atom sitting occupying that. So these are solved by the space group uh, crystallographers and so in this case, if you if you look at that 24M, 24M is somewhere here, it can occupy any one of these positions. Okay, so the main point which I wanted to tell here is that this Vikov position tells you about the stoichiometry of your sample. That means the composition of your sample. See, for example, this is the Vikov uh, crystallographic database information of cerium silver to germanium 2. In this case, cerium is sitting at 2A Vikov position which is occupying XYZ position 0, 0, 0, and silver is occupying 4D and germanium is occupying 4E. So that means you, if you divide all these things by 2, then you, you get the stoichiometry of this one, cerium silver to germanium 2. So the Vikov position also carries the information not only about the number of atoms in the unit cell, but it can also tell you about the stoichiometry of the compound. <coughs> and uh, many times, uh, if you are doing research, you need to know uh, whether the crystal structure is centrosymmetric or non-centrosymmetric. The non-centrosymmetric space groups are quite attractive because uh, in the case of non-centrosymmetric space group, the, there is no center of inversion symmetry. Inversion symmetry is up, or ups, absent. So what happens, you know, in that case, the, there is an electric field gradient inside the unit cell. So that electric field gradient results in some interesting physical properties. So you need to find out if the sample, if the space group is centrosymmetric or non-centrosymmetric. One of the best ways or easiest ways is to see that uh, you go to the international tables of crystallography or the Bilbao crystallographic server and go and look at the space group. Go to the highest Vikov position. If there is a place X, Y, Z, and if there is another place minus X, minus Y, minus Z for this position, then it is centrosymmetric. If it is not, then it is non-centrosymmetric. For example, here there is no position for minus x, minus y, minus z, then this is a non-centrosymmetric space group. Whereas in this case, if you go to the highest Vikov position, you see that x, y, z, minus x, minus y, minus z, then this is a centrosymmetric space group. So this is this kind of information without looking at the crystal structure, just by looking at the space group information, one can come to know about whether the sample is centrosymmetric or non-centrosymmetric. And uh, non-centrosymmetric space groups are quite uh, useful in case of second harmonic generation and uh, even in superconductors that are very attractive. So this information one can obtain just by looking at this Vikov position. Okay, uh, these are very, very, very trivial uh, information which you all of you must be knowing. Uh, there are seven types of crystal systems, cubic, tetragonal, orthorhombic, hexagonal, monoclinic, triclinic, and thrombohedral. And uh, these things with these four different types of unit cell leads to 14 possible Bravais lattice. And uh, let me explain to you. So these are, this is how the uh, lattice constant looks like. For a cubic system, A equal to B equal to C and alpha, beta, gamma equal to 90. For a tetragonal, A equal to B is not equal to C, alpha, beta, gamma equal to 90. It goes like this. So this is a textbook uh, thing which you can get it anywhere. Uh, so 
In the case of hexagonal systems, you have four indices. Miller indices is always represented by four indices, H, K, I, L. Typically, the Miller indices are represented as H, K, L, but here there is one more extra term is included, H, K, I, L, with the condition H plus K equal to minus I. That is because in the case of hexagonal system, uh, this 0, 1, 0 and 1, 1, 0, 1, 1 bar 0, they look as if they are two different, different planes, but they are actually representing the same plane. Just to avoid the confusion, they have added one more in this here in between H, K, I, L, so that you have this uh, uh, other way of identifying 1, 1 bar, 0, 0 or 0, 1, 1 bar. So that may, this will tell us that these and these are the same plane, that the confusion is, uh, is not there. So that is why they have used the fourth index, fourth uh, index with the condition H plus K equal to minus I. <coughs> Okay, so these are various examples of uh, crystal structure. The cubic crystal structure looks like this, the tetragonal crystal structure looks like this, and an orthorhombic crystal structure looks like this. So uh, these are various uh, lattice constant. For a tetragonal, you don't have a B axis because A is equal to B, which is not equal to C. So these you represent it only by A and C axis. Whereas for orthorhombic system, A is not equal to B is not equal to C. So you have three different uh, lattice constants here. <coughs> And uh, there are 230 space groups. 14 Babel lattice with various symmetry operations leads to 230 space groups. So all the inorganic materials discovered so far falls into one of these 230 space groups. <coughs> so if you if you look at the, what is a space group? Uh, so if you if you look at the space group, it is it has a capital letter followed by three uh, some uh, numbers or some small letters. So it looks like like this. The first one, the capital letter, tells you about the lattice type, whether it is face centered, body centered, or something like that. And these three i, j, k represents the symmetry operations one has to perform. Uh, so, for example, in the case of cubic system, the space group is F minus 4, 3, C. Space group number 219 is a, corresponds to a cubic uh, space group. Uh, the first symbol refers to face centered lattice. The second three letters refers to the symmetry operations one has to perform. So, like for example, if it is minus 4, fourfold rotation inversion because it is a minus here, this rotation and inversion axis where the symmetry operation has to be performed along the three crystallographic direction A, B and C. And the second symmetry operation 3 is threefold rotation axis along the diagonal of A and B. That means along the 1, 1, 0 direction you have to perform. And C is the axial glide plane along the diagonal of A, B and C. So these are how the symmetry operations one has to perform. So it looks a little bit complicated. Let me explain to you in a very simple naive way. And uh, these are these <coughs> first letters of the space group. It can be any one of this one. If it is I, it is body centered, body centered lattice. If it is F, it is a face centered lattice. So that's what it informs. So, uh, and these are the symmetry operations. The symmetry operation can be either M, A, B, C, or something, any one of these numbers and things like that. Each one has a specific uh, meaning. For example, M is a mirror plane, ABC is a glide plane, and N is a diagonal glide plane, and etc. So all this looks so complicated, uh, but uh, let me give you an example. Before I go to the example, let me just focus on this uh, cubic system because I'm going to explain to a uh, cubic system. So the, for the cubic system, we have to perform the symmetry operation, this I, J, K has to be performed along, the first symmetry operation has to be performed along A, B and C axis. The second symmetry operation J has to be performed along the diagonal and the third symmetry operation K should be performed along the diagonal of A, B and C. Okay, so now let us go back to NaCl thing. The NaCl, I told you that the four Na sodium atom occupies at the 4A Vico position which has XYZ as 0, 0, 0 and chlorine which sits at 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. Uh, so these are the positions which have been given. So this is where 0, 0, 0 is and 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. You place the sodium atom at one of the corners of the cube where everything is 0, 0, 0 and this green position corresponds to 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. No other information has been given. But if you look at this, this is the crystal structure of sodium chloride. But if you look at everywhere, when you search for the sodium chloride crystal structure, you will see that face centered lattice with all the atoms at all, all, the, core, all the, the lattice points. So, this is the basis, the basis information that is available in the crystallographic database. So, now, 
I told you that the first symmetry operation is that face centered lattice. So you put this basis, this sodium fluoride atom at one of the face centered lattice points. So as I told you in the initially, this is a face centered lattice. That means you have lattice points at these uh, corners and at the faces. So I'm just putting at one of the faces this uh, sodium and chlorine here. So this sodium chloride is kept here. The next symmetry operation, mirror plane, which has to be performed along A, B and C direction. So now if I put the mirror plane along A axis, that means I am putting, this is, your, this is my A axis, I am putting a mirror plane like this. For this sodium chlorine, sodium atom, you have a sodium atom here. For this sodium atom, you have a sodium atom here. So this is the mirror plane along A axis. Next is mirror plane along B axis. So I am putting a mirror plane. So for this uh, chlorine atom, you have another chlorine atom there. And then there is a other symmetry operation which is perpendicular to the unit cell. Then you have almost got the half of the unit cell. This is complete. And you have to perform this minus 3 rotation and inversion about 120 degrees along the 110 direction. And the final symmetry operation, mirror plane along the A, B and C direction. So if you do all the symmetry operation, finally you get this sodium chloride crystal structure like this. You start with this information and you perform these symmetry operations, you get this entire crystal structure. So this is how the crystal structure develops. The symmetry operation should be performed in the same sequence. In the sequence, in the same sequence. So for each of this crystallographic direction, you have been, uh, you have to follow this. For example, if it is a tetragonal, the first symmetry operation should be performed along the C axis and the second should be along the A and B axis third one along the diagonal of A and B. Why would the order matter if you have, they are all symmetry operations? They are symmetric, but see, uh, as far as I know, we have to follow this order, but I don't know, if, even if you don't follow the order, it should, as you told, it's a symmetry, then it should follow the same thing. I think you wouldn't get the same thing. So when, you, when you put a mirror plane, then you will lose that, because the other symmetry operation will rotate it, so you may not get it. I, I will show you another example of tetragonal system, that will tell you. See, for example, here, MOSA2 crystal structure. So, we have grown the single crystals of this compound, and uh, this is the crystallographic information that is available in the database. Its space group is I4 bar MMM. And uh, if I put, uh, it should be at the origin here, but unfortunately, I made a mistake here. But anyway, still it works out. Uh, so, this molybdenum atom, this is silicon atom. So the first symmetry operation is I. I means body center. You put this basis here at the center of this unit cell. Then the second symmetry operation is 4 bar M, 4 pole rotation axis with a mirror plane. So this is a mirror plane, 4 pole rotation along the C axis, you rotate by 90 degrees, and then you put a mirror plane, you get almost half of this unit cell. It is already there. And then the second symmetry operation is the mirror plane along the A axis. That means you put a mirror plane perpendicular to the A axis you get the complete unit cell. You don't need to perform the third symmetry operation M here to get the unit cell because for this compound, even this within these two symmetry operations, you can get the entire unit cell. But in some other cases, you may need to perform all the symmetry operations to get this. So this is how the unit cell, unit cell although the basic crystallographic information is available only this one, you take any crystallographic software, you enter this, you finally end up with this, uh, in this crystal structure. But actually, this is how it develops. So, I don't know this was yeah. interesting. If it's 10 how come the basis will be 1 molybdenum and 1 silicon? So, this is what is this one. The molybdenum sits at 2A position and silicon sits at 4E position. So, the 4E position is 0.000435. So, this tells me the stoichiometry of this one. There are two molybdenum atoms in the unit cell and four silicon atoms in the unit cell. So, if I see that, it, it becomes, ultimately, it works out to be MOS. So, in the final one, if I count yeah, the yeah. number back you will, you will get that. So, you, you can just calculate this one, the four corners, one by eight, one by eight, there is two molybdenum atoms. And so at the center, sorry, the center one, and these constitute two molybdenum atom, And the rest, you can come that as a silicon atom. Okay, so just to tell you some example about the various symmetry operations, this is a glide plane. Glide plane is nothing but a mirror reflection and a translation. Translation is done half the lattice vector. If it is A, 
that means it should be the half the lattice constant of this A. And if it is B, then it is half the lattice constant of that B axis. So this is just to show you how the glide plane uh, symmetry operation will work out. It's just it gets mirror reflected and translated by half the lattice constant. And this is another example which is for an orthorhombic space group, how the space group develops based on these symmetry operations I, J, K. Okay, just for the students sake, so how, uh, so suppose if you are making some samples in our lab, first thing we wanted to know is that whether the phase has formed, whether the desired compound which we intended to prepare has it formed or not. The first tool that we do is that X-ray diffraction. And using the X-ray diffraction, depending on the peak positions, you can easily find out whether the phase has formed or not. So this is the, uh, these are the at atomic planes and atoms are arranged in this one. And uh, using the Bragg's law 2D sin theta equal to n lambda, you, whenever the condition 2D sin theta equal to n lambda is satisfied, you will see a peak in your X-ray diffractogram. And then from the peak position, you can estimate the D value and then you can estimate the lattice constant and everything. So, this is how for a powder diffractometer, uh, you, if you use a monocular lambda, is, the, the main thing is that in the case of powder X-ray diffraction, lambda is fixed, theta is varying. That means uh, the diffraction happens at all angles, the detector covers all the two theta uh, diffracted beams and because of that, you see whenever the condition 2D sin theta equal to n lambda is satisfied, you see a peak in your X-ray diffractogram. So, supposing if I don't powder the sample, if I put a single crystal there, then there is only one orientation, only one crystallographic plane, then that means the monochromatic X-ray will just find out only those peaks corresponding to that particular plane. Suppose if it is a C-axis oriented crystal, then you will see that 0, 0 L peaks in the powder X-ray diffractor. <coughs> so, these are some other uh, characterization using powder X-ray diffraction. Suppose we need to know about the crystal structure, which space group, which crystal structure it belongs, then you can do the powder X-ray diffraction and you can estimate this lattice constant. And the X-ray diffraction is one of the methods we can use to identify the structure of crystalline solids. And XRD patterns are somewhat like fingerprints. Each one of us has a different finger. For a particular system, the X-ray diffraction, whether you do it here or in US or wherever you do that, the X-ray diffraction will look the same. Uh, so that is the XRD patterns are unique to that particular material. Um, so, <coughs> and also you can get to know the information about the size and shape of the unit cells. And apart from that, sometimes you can also get to know about the uh, particle size information, crystallite size information in that. Okay, these are uh, various formula you can use uh, from the powder X-ray diffraction, how to estimate the lattice constant. Uh, from the theta value, you can estimate D and from this, uh, uh, from the HKL values, you have to index this powder X-ray diffraction pattern and from the HKL values, you can estimate the lattice parameter. Uh, this is, so as I told you, suppose if you if you know this Y composition and the space group information, there are software which are available which can simulate the powder X-ray diffraction. So this is just a simulated powder X-ray diffraction pattern. Like for example, you, there is a software called powder cell. Uh, so you have to input the space group information, the lattice constant information and put the Y composition details. And uh, when you click OK, then you will get this uh, beautiful uh, simulated X-ray diffraction pattern. Okay, so we work mainly on single crystals and uh, the advantage of growing, growing a single crystal is to study the directional dependent properties. So having grown a crystal, how do I find out the, what is the crystallographic direction? For that, we are using Lowe diffraction. So the main difference between the Lowe diffraction and the powder X-ray diffraction is that in the case of Lowe diffraction, theta is fixed, lambda is varying. In the case of powder X-ray diffraction, lambda is fixed, theta is varying. So that's the main difference. And uh, the, here, the, the idea is very simple. You have a white source of X-ray, which is collimated, and it falls on the sample, and it gets back reflected, and you put a screen image plate here, and you collect the information. And sometimes the sample may be transparent to X-ray. You can put a uh, film here, and then you can get a transmitted X-ray, and you can get the information from the transmitted pattern as well. So, uh, how, why this uh, diffraction spot occurs? That is because of the evolved sphere. So you have with the crystal at the center, with 1 by lambda as the wavelength, uh, as, as the radius, you construct some sphere and whenever the sphere cuts these planes, then you will get a spot in your X-ray diffraction pattern, diffraction pattern. So the, I will show you some of the diffraction pattern which, uh, sorry, I will just skip all this thing. 
Ah, this is the experimental setup. This is an X-ray generator where a small filament, tungsten filament, it produces electrons and it is accelerated by a potential of about 25 kilo volts, 25,000 volts from here to here and it is stopped by a molybdenum target and because of this there is a large heat is generated and this is, this is water cooled up to the, at this point and uh, you get you get x-rays generated these x-rays are collimated through these two collimators here and it falls on the sample and gets back reflected since we are working on metallic samples these x-rays get back reflected and then you collect the image using this image plate from the image plate you can get this information you can get this get to see these kind of nice, beautiful patterns, diffraction patterns. So, using the uh, lattice constant of the space group and the uh, lattice constant information, you can simulate these diffraction patterns and we can compare our experimental and simulated pattern and we can identify what is the crystallographic direction. So, just to show you, these are some of the examples of a cubic system. For a 100, you will see this kind of pattern. For uh, and again, these red colored dots are simulated patterns. They are perfectly matching with the experimental and the simulated one. And this is along the 111 direction. So, finally, this is what uh, the take home message is that you might have understood how a crystal structure is formed and how to calculate the number of atoms in the unit cell, which is very, very simple if you know the crystallographic details. Uh, and you have learned something about the powder X ray diffraction and single crystal X ray diffraction, Lauer diffraction. So, if you have any questions, I will be happy to answer. So, are yes. directly related? Yes, yes. Can I ask you? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. So, how do you decide which material to go a single time? I'm sure you have internet magnetic properties, probably with magnetic magnetization. So, how do you decide? Okay, is okay. see, one of the ways is that uh, our expertise is on growing a single crystal. So, we look in the literature, if there are no single crystal data is available, and let us say that recently we published one uh, anisotropic studies on a superconductor, niobium rhenium silicon, which has a TC of 6 Kelvin. It's not a big deal, superconductivity at 6 Kelvin, there are many, many such systems which are superconducting at low temperatures. So, but this is a non-central symmetric system. As I told you, the crystallographic, the center of inversion is missing there. And these non-central symmetric superconductors are quite interesting because they show a very high, large upper pressure, <coughs> and they are useful for magnet applications and all these things. But the problem still is that it is at superconducting at six Kelvin. You should go below six Kelvin to have to take advantage of all this uh, magnetic. But there are no anisotropic studies. So the anisotropy occurs. The upper critical field will be different along different crystallographic directions. So, the polycrystalline data gives an average information of this one. But we have studied in detail about this, this hexagonal system. Mm -hmm. So, along the basal plane and along the C-axis, we saw a difference in the upper critical field. And the referee has accepted our, uh, uh, whatever that particular property that we have we studied. And it has got published in physical review. So, what is the upper critical field? That is about 9 tesla there. It's not so high. Typically, uh, when there is a triplet pairing, then it will have a huge hundreds of Tesla. Yeah, but in this case, it's very, it's, it's very small. Accessible in the TP. Yes, yes, yes. And we, we, your uh, study will also give inputs to be able to sim try to simulate it on the computer. Uh, sometimes, but you know, can... these days, these days, we are working on topological materials as well. There are huge amount of humongous database about this band structure. So, they have almost this uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence has enabled you just take two or three elements from the periodic table. What are the possibilities of these uh, compounds that can form energy minimization? And they have put the uh, phase diagram uh, by uh, this uh, band structure calculations. So the band structure information gives some idea about which material to choose to work for. Suppose if there is a band crossing, a linear band crossing, then the Dirac cone. This is one of the hot topics these days. And you see a huge magnetor resistance in those cases. So, the first thing the student comes to our lab and then he just tries to explore all these materials and with the facilities what we have, almost we can grow any type of crystal in our lab. So, that is the advantage that we have, except for high pressure synthesis. So, if it is under ambient condition, if anybody has grown elsewhere, we can definitely grow it in our lab. And with the facilities that we have, we can study those material properties. Yes. You spoke about softwares that can simulate. simulate. Yes, yes. Why, why, why would you choose to simulate it rather than doing 
So the thing is that first we do the experimental and then we wanted to know whether the phase has formed, whether the desired phase has formed. How do we uh, confirm that? So what we do is that we simulate the powder X-ray diffraction and we overlap our experimental pattern on top of this. Suppose there is a peak here. In our experimental data, we don't have, we don't see this peak. And we see another new peak here. Then I can say that this is, has not formed in this desired phase. It has formed in some other phase. So that is why I just compare it with the simulated pattern. So this all depends on the lattice constant, that 5.4420. That decides where the peak should appear. If provided, if your sample has formed in the same crystal structure. If it has formed in a different crystal structure, then you will see the peaks at different places. Supposing, let us say that I have sodium chloride and I have doped a small amount of potassium in place of sodium. Then the X-ray diffraction will not happen, the, the peaks will not be at the same place. It will be slightly shifted either up, uh, right or up left. That is because your lattice constant changes because sodium has a different ionic radius, potassium has a different ionic radius. So if the unit cell has compressed, it's a chemical pressure, then the, this X-ray diffraction pattern will be slightly off from this. That will give me an information about the lattice. So these are free software available. Uh, you can just uh, simulation of powder X-ray diffractometer will get you this uh, thing. There are plenty of softwares available to simulate a powder X-ray diffractometer. So you actually compare the experimental data with uh, models, then they are doing uh, like uh, simulations of refinement, but that will tell how good, how pure the material is. So they one phase or multi phase. So we can actually exactly calculate how many phases ones. So that refinement is for research purpose. But uh, if you if you take any material from your chemistry lab and you want to do a powder X-ray diffraction, you can get the powder X-ray diffraction. You can estimate the lattice constant from this by just using this formula. If it's a cubic, it's very trivial to find out. So all that you need to do is that you have to index this peak. This peak is 111, this is 200. There are literature available for this one. You just index it. And depending on if you have made some doping, then this peak, this 111 instead of appearing at 29 degrees, it may appear at 30 degree 2 theta. Then for that 30 degree 2 theta, you just calculate D and you can estimate the lattice. You have done no problem, isn't it? Oh, you have already given the one problem. problem related to that. So, I see. I see. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. The experiment mentioned the X-ray quality. Yes. Yes. No, this is just a metallic tube. So, so see, the, the X-rays are uh, generated here, and they are rooted through this. Uh, there is a metal tube. That's it. And the X-rays goes through. Oh, this is a physical sample. Physical. Okay. And then, uh, when the sample is there, we put a collimator and we focus it because once it comes out, it diverges like this. So to focus that, uh, we use a narrow collimator, and that so even for a small sample, that diameter is 0.8 mm. So even if your uh, sample is one millimeter in size, we can focus the uh, X-ray on that. <clears throat> You mentioned non film, non film. Non -film. Non -film. This morning, if there is any relation between the central symmetry and the supercondition. Yeah, I see, that's what I was telling him. The non central symmetric compounds are showing interesting chemical properties because of the fact that they are not uniform in there, that the atoms are not uniform when you rotate it upside down. So that means there is some internal electric field gradient is there. So because each atoms are point charges. So, if you consider these electrons or uh, valence electrons, so they are moving everywhere, the nucleus is a point charge. And because of that, because the, there is no center of inversion there, there is an electric field gradient. So, this electric field gradient results in some interesting property. One of the things is that the non central symmetric compounds shows a large uh, upper critical field in superconductors. And then, in the case of nonlinear optical materials, it produces second harmonic temperature. This is one of the important criteria for. Uh, Second harmonic temperature. Uh, so, non central symmetric compounds are important in that aspect. Uh, so the easiest way to find out is that take out the phase group information, go to the highest spike of position, highest multiplicity, and look for the position xyz minus x minus y minus z. That is a possibility in that case, then that is a central symmetry. There is no possibility of atoms placing in that, then it is not. I was just wondering. 
uh, it can be explained hmm. uh, within the TCS theory framework or something. Like no, 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 no. This is unconventional and this, this does not obey the way TCS. So one more question related to that is the non center symmetric ones. Hmm. So, generally, multi are also very much uh, not center symmetric because of this manual elastic. Yes, yes, yes. So, why manual elastic? How the manual elastic couplings are correlated with the non center symmetric uh, positions? Uh, like, uh, some but I don't know about the multi but about this central symmetric, uh, non center symmetric, the, in the case of uh, superconductors, there are possibility of triplet pairing. The Cooper pass can, can form in the same direction, so that is one one of the advantages of having. And because of that, the uh, upper critical field is quite large. Yeah. Uh, yes. Regarding the wipe of position, hmm. it enhances to bound the number of atoms which is there in the unit. Does it also tell like where the uh, atoms are situated before? Of course. Before see, for example, would be something. Yes, yes, yes. So if you go and see the uh, standard uh, crystallographic database, for example, for this phase group for number one twenty two, these are the only possible positions. That means the first place A, A it has zero zero zero. It can have the position zero zero zero, or it can have point five zero zero point seven five. So, for this phase group, these are the only allowed possibilities. So, the crystallographers solve the crystal structure and they get to know the information about the space group. Then, they go and place the atoms at these places and they just find the best fit for that. That's how they solve the crystal structure. So, for example, for this phase group, you have a totally different kind of, like of uh, multiplicity. So, in this case, the A position has this one. And there can be four atoms in the unit cell. Hmm. So, when you grow these crystals in your lab, hmm. how do you ensure that you are growing a single crystal of that one? That is what? The first slide, if you remember, ah, anything so. which produces diffraction spots or single crystallines. But is there something during the formation process? That no, 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 no. The formation process is, uh, see, for, for example, I will tell you in a very naive way. You know, to grow a single crystal, you have to take it to its liquid state. Any solid cannot be converted just by doing some magic, you cannot do that. So, you have to take it to its liquid state. Say, for example, sodium chloride. Sodium chloride melts at 800 degrees centigrade. But that means if you want to grow your single crystal of sodium chloride, you need to have a furnace which can go up to 800 degrees centigrade. So, you melt the sodium chloride and then do some process, either slowly cool down or pull the crystal out. You can do this one. But you don't need to do all these things to grow sodium chloride. As you know, sodium chloride dissolves in water. So you don't need to take it to the melting point. You dissolve it in water at room temperature. Let us say that 25 degrees. Let us, for example, you take 100 ml of water and let's say 10 grams of sodium chloride dissolves at room temperature. When you put the 11th gram, it will not dissolve further. It is saturated. So you heat the sodium chloride solution to 50 degrees. You can add 5 more grams of sodium chloride. When you put the 16th gram, it will not dissolve. You have super saturated solution. Then you allow from 50 degrees to cool down to 25 degrees. You have excess dissolved sodium chloride, which will segregate out. So this, if you cool down very slowly, you will have single crystals. You will have multiple nucleations inside your beaker. You can do it in your, in your home, in your room. Just take some glass, uh, glass beaker and put hot water and dissolve some sodium or sugar for that matter. And you can see that the uh, second day, third day, you can see nucleation happening in that. And you take out this one of these crystals, which has grown reasonably big size, tie it in a thread. Again, make a super saturated solution, dip it inside the solution. Then you can see that the crystal grows on that nucleation. And that grows into a larger crystal. The first thing, it just develops at various places because of the multiple nucleation. So if you have a constant temperature bath, suppose you in your room, you are having this one. And then somebody opens the door or in the morning, evening, daytime, the temperature fluctuations, there will be multiple nucleations. If you can maintain somehow a constant temperature box, there will be only one nucleation which is happening at that uh, tight uh, sample and that crystal will grow into a So this you can plan as an experiment for your... Use. How slowly you have to cool for that? Like that See, for example, you don't need to do any sophisticated <laughs> instrument. Just cover it in an aluminum foil, make some perforations, leave it as such. The second day, come, come and see, there will be lots of crystals. 
third day you just tie it one of the thing copper sulfate is the best thing okay. the students will love to see the facets which are forming okay. so it it has a beautiful facet and after it grows you just apply some nail polish over that and it'll become a very shiny look you can keep it in your wherever so this uh, lab or something like that it looks very beautiful so the good uh, undergraduate experiments they can do it in their whole they you know room with them Okay. Thank you. Thank you.